everyone, and welcome to the Latin Alternative Music Conference's music publishing panel. I am Jorge Mejia, president and CEO of Sony Music Publishing Latin America and US Latin, and I am very happy to be this panel's moderator. Today, we have assembled some of the industry's luminaries for you from the heads of the Latin divisions of some of the biggest music publishing companies in the world to some of the most successful music publishing companies in the world period. And the nicest part about all this is that um, I get to say that most of them are my friends. So without further ado, let's just get started. Let's stop, let's, let's, why don't we just introduce ourselves? Let's go around the screen. Uh, let's start with Alexandra. Uh, thank you, Jorge. My name is Alexandra Lutikov, and I'm the president of Universal Music Publishing for LATAM in the U.S. Latin uh, territory, and super happy to be here with all my colleagues. Wonderful. Let's go with Larry. Hi, I'm Larry Mistel. I'm the founder and CEO of Primary Wave Music, and I'm very happy to be here with all of you today. Great. Gustavo? Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Gustavo Menendez. I'm president of Warner Chapel Music for Latin America and U.S. Latin. And as most of you, I'm very happy to be here and sharing this panel with you guys. Great. Eliezer. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Eliezer Ponce. I am the director of a &R for uh, BMG Music Publishing, focusing on U.S. Latin. And again, it's a pleasure being here. All right, and Emilio? Hello, everyone. My name is Emilio Morales. I am the publishing director at Rimas Entertainment, and uh, I'm greatly honored to be with all of you and uh, these uh, incredible colleagues that have, have been assembled today. So thank you, Jorge. All right, well, thanks, everyone. I mean, now that we know who is here with us, and, and there's a lot of experience in this room, uh, let's just get started with a few questions. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to direct the question initially to one person, and then if we could just open up the conversation and if you could add your voice to the discussion, that would be fantastic. So, Alex, let's go ahead and start with you. Music publishing for the past couple of years in parallel with the music industry has been growing. What are some of the fastest growing music publishing segments that you've seen? Uh... Okay, um, segments mean like in- Revenue sources, revenue sources? Oh, well, of course, uh, digital. We think, uh, we know that Latin music has had an explosion. And one of the reasons is because uh, streaming, everybody in the world has now the opportunity to listen to different kinds of music whenever they want. And uh, streaming has helped, in my opinion, to make Latin music global. Of course, um, one of the biggest, uh, uh, you know, que lleva la bandera is Bad Bunny. And I'm gonna pass it then to Emilio now, who is the publisher. Uh, and I just feel the streaming is, uh, will continue to grow. And one of the things that uh, I see in Latin America is one of the things Latin people are very loyal, loyal to music, loyal to um, ways of listening to music. And as soon as streaming came into the region, uh, people started to use the streaming platforms like crazy and it's going up and that has been the biggest change. And I think has been really good for Latin music around the globe. So that's my take. Yeah, to, to add to that answer, does anybody want to comment on what uh, streaming platforms in particular are the biggest uh, across the region from your experience? Gustavo? Definitely Spotify is the number one um, platform that we have in LATAM. Uh, and like Alexandra said, the growth has been exponential uh in latam there's i think north of 100 million um monthly active users and uh that basically represents 21 percent of uh, the total um active users in spotify in the world so uh 
you know, that kind of like gives you an idea of um, how important Latin America has become, not only in producing some of this music that is traveling around the world, but the engagement that uh, um, the Latin American audience has. And I have, uh, uh, adding to what Gustavo says, it's very interesting. When you see the, in Spotify, the global charts, and uh, you see a lot of Latin music in the global charts, and then you see which territories uh, um, make that song go to the global charts, a lot of them are from Latin America. Yep. It, it has to do with the loyalty of the listener, the loyalty of, of, of the fans, and how much streaming is going on in Latin America. So it, whether it's uh, uh, Latin music or Anglo music or something, when it goes into Latin America, it helps them get them to get helps them to get in the global chart. Yeah. Jorge, um, you know, just just adding to that, you know, streaming obviously has been transformational from uh, for the, the for the business in general, um, and it certainly saved the business in many ways. But to me, some of the most exciting things apart from streaming um, is just simply technology. You know, TikTok and Peloton and all these technology platforms. I think we're just getting started. I think there is going to be a, 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 a boom for quite some time in additional technology platforms that will be paying songwriters royalties. And, and in addition to that, to me, one of the most exciting things is as technology gets better, uh, the ability to collect uh, in emerging markets and bring emerging markets online to me is a very, very big opportunity from a revenue stream perspective. So, you know, I, I, obviously streaming is the number one driver, uh, but there are so many things that are gonna be adding to our collective revenue streams, I think in the future. So would you say we're at the, at the, at the start of, of an even greater boom? Because we've seen a huge boom in the last five years. Do you think that we're just getting started and it's, it's all very positive going forward? I, I, I personally do. I mean, we are investing literally billions of dollars into, you know, great music and, and great, you know, intellectual property that's global. So I, I do think we're still in the very beginning stages of a lot of these additional revenue streams. That's fantastic. Um, and, uh, Ellie. One thing I wanted to add on the regarding the streaming uh, and the platforms and the DSPs is that we've seen a, a growth and a bigger interest in them in their publishing services division. For us as publishers, it's very important to know that the DSPs are also focusing on the creators, on the songwriters, on, on the producers of these songs, and they're giving them their respected uh, playlisting and, 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 and giving them the, the recognition that they deserve and to hand, you know, hand in hand with that, how do you get that is with the metadata and you know and i think apart from a, a not necessarily a, a trend but you know the all these efforts and everything that's been going on in perfecting the process of the metadata of the information for the songs for the creator for everything i think that allows for like larry was saying all these new opportunities to come so that then we can accurately track the performances and pay the right people as more opportunities keep coming. So I think it's very important to uh, understand that we have people there that are actually paying attention to who the writers are or who the producers are and, and making sure that all that is extremely in line so that then money can come in. And so I think it's it's all very related and exciting with what's happening right now. Well, yeah, I think we're going to get to metadata in, in a minute, uh, for sure. It's a key, key aspect of the growth and our, our ability to collect on that growth. Uh, before we get there, though, I'd like to direct one question to Emilio. What trends do you see currently happening? Trends you see currently happening in the music publishing world that perhaps were not so obvious a few years ago? Um, <clears throat> well... For starters, uh, uh, I would say that, you know, since uh, the, the ability through technologies uh, and, and the DSPs uh, for a Latin music to be consumed uh, everywhere on a pretty much, you know, it's instantaneous, um, you know, in an instantaneous way, you know, the same day that you release music in in, in, in through you through the distributor everyone gets to hear it so 
um, that has uh, helped a lot, you know, uh, Latin artists to have a uh, presence and uh, have more engaging fans uh, on uh, uh, markets that, you know, uh, you you wouldn't see that uh, a few years ago, uh, 10 years ago or five years ago, it wasn't so much, you know, nowadays, when we travel abroad, we we see people from London and, and the other sides of the world saying to us like, hey, I'm a fan actually of, of your of your Latina stars and 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 the, a fan of the guys in this call, you know, uh, of your of your clients. So um, that's that the the technology has uh, provided again uh, the the tools necessary for for that kind of uh, expansion uh, and uh, you know fan base from the clients that we represent and uh, you know that's 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 where it started. And that's just on the on the creative part of it, right? But on the, I would say that also with that, um, not only do the fan bases now nowadays listen to them via the DSPs, it, it has provoked a a byproduct, and that byproduct is that uh, um, uh, it, it, it's only it's not only consuming the DSPs nowadays. No, the the guys from the from the film industry or the or the other sectors want to actually license music from Latin stars nowadays more more than ever because uh, they have actually been able to consume it and become fans, right? So uh, um, we've seen that in the in in other sectors in sectors of of licensing such as film, video games. Uh, We've received a lot of uh, video game requests, um, and uh, as you guys said, other technologies such as TikTok and everything. Er everyone's trying to to dance to the Latin music nowadays, you know, and and do their 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 little TikTok. So um, mm -hmm. it's it's been fantastic. So I I think it's a new that that's definitely a new trend. <laughs> so one of the trends you you identify is the ubiquity of Latin music around the world aided by technology. It's something that yeah. before Latin music was prevalent and there was one big hit and so on. But now it's it's everywhere. Obviously, obviously, I mean, Bad Bunny's success, which you 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 publish, Emilio, it's it's all it's everywhere. That's what you're identifying as one of the biggest trends, right? Latin music. Uh, appearing pretty much everywhere. Does anybody yes. comment on that or add to that? I actually do have a comment, and, and that's just kind of a, a funny thing to hear. Is um, I hear a lot of uh, people in a lot. I hear people in the states that don't speak Spanish. They are in awe that wow, people are listening to Latin music, even if they don't speak the language. It's like, wait a minute, we in, La in the region of Latin America or in Spain, I used to listen to English speaking music without understanding a word of English. I mean, we've been consuming music like that forever. And now that has been reversed. And I can also add to that, you know, like K-pop and and now you know the Afro pop and the uh, French urban Italian and it's so interesting how is that's like a surprise for the uh, English speaking community. Sorry, Larry, I don't know if you say that, <laughs> but it, that's what I hear and it's really yeah. interesting to me. Well, well I, I would say as the uh... As the Anglo representative uh, on this panel, uh, as part of our marketing plans now, in, in almost every instance, um, we're encouraging our artists to recreate their hit songs um, in Latin, you know, in in in, in a Spanish-speaking format. So, um, you know, it, it is a it's a very big market. It's only growing and becoming more important. And the the, the request that we've seen on general. Uh, market focused movies and 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 brands and and products for Latin music, it's been huge. Before you would you. you would get a Latin song in a scene in East LA where they're in the backyard or in Miami or in Puerto Rico or when they're flying into Puerto Rico or the Dominican Republic. Now 
there's a regular scene where they're in a bar in the middle of the city in Salt Lake City. And when the, you go into the club, what they're playing in the club is reggaeton or Latin music. So, you know, when, when you see those kind of things, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, but I have to mention that I, I think uh, we should not get comfortable because as you have so much music going into the uh, platforms, like before, you know, on radio, they put a, a, a playlist of certain amount of songs and that was it. Now you have thousands of songs going on and of course the best songs stay on, etc. So we cannot forget uh, um, as publishers to really still think about the quality of the song or the song that can be work for a single or help for a single or a hit. And also like Jorge was saying in the new trends of, of music, really uh, look at what is coming and, and having our eyes out there, ears out there to see what is coming because everything is moving so fast that um, the same way the Latin music has exploded, and it took a lot of people by surprise, that, that's, the, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. I think other genres are coming in and can take us by surprise. So just again, I think we should keep up and, and create and helping the writers and producers to create uh, or to put out there the best music possible. Huh. Yeah, uh, the speed at which things are happening is has been greatly accelerated by technology. Absolutely. Well, on that note, I'd like to go to the next question, and I'd like to pose it to Gustavo. Collaborations are becoming ever more common, and almost always, I mean, songs these days have a multitude of writers. It's It's rare, in my experience these days, to have a song written by a single writer, a hundred percenter. That's that's very unusual now. What is your feeling, Gustavo, on the best way to approach splits? Um, uh -huh. that's a tough one. It's gotten a little complicated because you know you, you have not only <laughs> five writers in a room or three writers in the room, but then like people keep popping up, even when they were not in the room. Um, so it is tricky. Um, if that was if the best way possible, it would be, you know, that the people that write the song are in the room and right after you finish the song, you have a hard conversation and the writers need to decide, uh, you know, what is their, the, the percentage of the song that they control and that it's fair or that they really participated on. Um, they're the only ones that know exactly what happened um, in the room. But again, uh, since now we have um, participants um, or other writers that are not in the room, it, it gets a little complicated, it's tricky. Um, and the thing that is not that funny is sometimes, and, and I'm sure you guys feel, uh, feel the pain, takes months to decide the, the final splits on, on a freaking song. You're like, why? <laughs> it's like two months, three months, and you cannot register the song until it's, the, the whole thing is done. And it's kind of um, uh, a mess, but it's it's a reality of today. Yeah, I, I think we're all snickering when we talk about splits because we've all felt the pain of a big hit song and... Uh, what are the splits? Ah, uh, they're still figuring them out, and 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 it's it's and painful. It, and magically, uh, the math is kind of like wrong. You end up with one hundred and seventeen percent, and you're like, oh, <laughs> wait a minute, it's supposed to be a hundred. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm going to make it even more difficult. Yeah. Um, so yeah, fun times. Yeah, we we've we've all, yeah we've all shared that. So I think that is one of the ways as as basic as it sounds to boost songwriting income wouldn't you say if if we found uh a better way and i don't know what better way there could be to figuring out splits if it was almost like a law you don't get out of the studio until you figure it out and if there are other actors that come in then then you figure it out then but but that <laughs> We, it almost feels like we need to find a better system. I don't know. What do you guys think? So, 
say it's funny because I've like all of us have tried to figure it out. And I, I thought, I have a great idea. I'm going to talk some sense into these writers. And I'm going to be a mother figure and go and <laughs> <laughs> as, as a speech about the importance. So I remember going to this studio with <laughs> these urban guys. And here is this lady <laughs> talking to them in a very... Uh -huh. You know, uh, teacher way, like, you know, before leaving, you need to make sure before leaving that uh, door, out the door, you have to do this, please. And they're having drinks and looking at me like, what are you talking about? We're just here having fun. We don't have time for that. And oh, this, I tried. Time. It didn't work out. <laughs> FYI. <laughs> so anyway. Did, did you get 2% of the song for negotiating the piece? <laughs> no, they literally kicked me out of the studio. <laughs> so it's like, I was like, not happening there. <laughs> anyway, now left. <laughs> but uh, Larry, you're right. I mean, I think you just hit it on the head. It's, it's, it's a negotiation and it really shouldn't be. It's like whoever wrote something deserves, you know, whatever piece. But it's not, it ends up being a negotiation. Yeah. Strange. I, I, I kind of, I, I would say that, uh, and I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I re, re, you know, sometimes we find each other even uh, looking for each one of us in this room right now uh, and helping each other because uh, sometimes uh, it's even so difficult that uh, uh, we have to use our ourselves and our teams to help actually um, facilitate the process to actually get it registered so we can all collect our monies. And, uh, um, but it shouldn't be that hard. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be uh, a thread with a hundred emails or, or, you know, or, or, or ourselves sending emails to the label or, or whatever, you know, um, when it's, it's, and, you know, I, I have all kinds of, questions uh because uh you know um at the end of the day i uh there's sometimes a lot of people also, also like sneaking into the splits that um actually do do not have anything to do with the copyright of the song they are not the writers and they are not the publishers and and they are sneaking into the splits and uh um and actually uh a funny one the other day that we i received was and and i i've I think I've never said this. Um, the the other day we we received one with a uh, uh, public a a agency that wanted um, to be included in a in a and I I I went crazy. You know I I called the guys. <laughs> what, what the hell is this? You know um, it, you you guys cannot do that. You know. Um, you mean um, a, a PR firm? A PR firm? It's somebody like doing public relations? Yes. Yeah, yes. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so so every time we we are seeing, uh, as you said, it's it's becoming ever uh, ever increasing uh, more. Um, now, any anyone wants uh, their um, PRO awards and things like that, and they wanna. So it's it's becoming a challenge actually for the rightful uh, creators to actually and seriously be compensated the way they should be because they we have these contributors and they and they they are not asking for two percent sometimes they are actually looking for five or ten percent i'm saying like what the hell is that you know and uh so it doesn't make sense to me at least i i think that we are all uh, in this in the same feeling so mm -hmm. um you know i i think it's something that uh uh, maybe in the future we can work around and see if we can look for some solution other than emails because yeah. it's difficult. It it's very time consuming for every every single one of our teams. I think that Lennon, Lennon and McCartney, 50, 50, two people, and that's it. Let's put a um, limit and that will make it easy. Yeah, and Alexandra touched, touched on, a, on a great point, which is the educating part. I think that educating the, the songwriter and the producer yes. and having them understand exactly what it is that you did and that hey you made the beat but that's also considered a songwriter so don't let them tell you that you you know and 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 then 
our communication, our internal communication and the communication with management and, and, and understanding. And like, like I say, if we're in dispute, nobody gets paid. Coming from the PRO world, that is the biggest mistake you could do. Like if there's a dispute, nobody gets paid. And no, every, we all want the money. And so, and then there's no licenses and then they, you can't pitch it for sync. And, and it's like all these other chain reaction of things that happen that you don't get to monetize on it. But uh, I would actually be very interested, Emilio, in, in, in what uh, manual we can write or, or how we can do it to kind of like educate and, and have it like a formality of, hey, you're going into it, read this book, here it is. And then we talk about it, you know. But I think communication with managers and, and and letting them understand and you know and if they now you know we got managers taking percentages you got all these things happening and if that's the case then you deal that from with your writer but you know and and the thing is that having everybody be on the same page and that it's 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 the hardest thing that I think we do in our business apart from being psychologists and psychiatrists I think that that is the the hardest part of our job. So I just want to mention, uh, since we're talking about this to, to our audience, that uh, pub the publishing business, we're here to protect you guys. We're here to protect the writers. We're here to defend your rights and, and defend what you create. And I think sometimes that's lost in... in because they don't see what goes behind the scenes. And I think it's important to also send that message. Like uh, uh, me and all the colleagues that are here, uh, we, that's what we do. Uh, that's part of our job. When we have a writer in our company, we are there to protect that writer and los intereses, you know, for, for you know, for your future. So I think that's very important. And I, and I think that- well, I think that's a great point that Alexandra makes. And, um, you know, I think it just, in terms of trends, uh, you know, you're seeing much better copyright protection. You're seeing the NMPA, which is absolutely fantastic. David Israelite and his staff holding these applications, apps, technology platforms accountable. Um, and this is very important uh, for songwriters. They need to make a living off the, their, their creative endeavors. So uh, I think that's a very important positive trend in the business. And yeah. as unfortunate as the pandemic was, I think that, you know, a lot of bad things came with that. But I think that that was actually a wake up call to a lot of artists and, and artist writers and, 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 and songwriters because all of a sudden they're their touring income which a lot of them that's kind of like what they relied on and they were like that was like their biggest priority because they were so busy just touring and making that cash all of a sudden when that stopped and they started seeing what is it really that i'm bringing in it was a big eye opener for a lot of people and then they're like well, well you know this song was never registered we gotta fix this and i've been trying to catch you and look at your email thread and this that and the other and then that was like a trigger effect of, of having a lot of things being fixed because all of a sudden they have no money and they're not getting the, the same income that they used to have before. So I think that, I'm, I'm not gonna say that it got fixed, but we saw a big improvement, at least in, in my side of, of fixing catalogs and making sure that a lot of the registrations and everything was on point when they had that hard realization that, hey, all of a sudden all our money stopped, now what do we do? So yeah. So, so in, that, in that spirit, and Alex, I think your point of, of emphasizing that we're here for our songwriters, that's what, what we do. And Larry, your point of saying that that is exactly what is happening more and more. Uh, in that spirit, how about, uh, Larry, I, I know you, you handle a, a, a breadth of things, not just publishing and so on. So from your vantage point, however, uh, what, how do you think songwriters could potentially boost their publishing earnings, aside from making sure the splits are all <laughs> yeah. set up? I mean, listen, that, that is the question, and that is the reason that we are specifically in business, because, you know, we, we are not a passive uh, music publisher like a lot of these very new uh, funds and, and banks that have come into the business to acquire uh, a rights in the last two or three years. Everybody on this call has been in business for a very long time. Our perspective is, you know, you know, we're in the Prince business, Bob Marley, James Brown, The Doors, Whitney Houston, Ray Charles. We're in the icon and legend business. And so the way songwriters and the way 
these uh, these legendary artists can boost their income is by marketing, branding, content creation. You know, those are really uh, the big ways to increase value, increase revenue stream. And, uh, you know, that's frankly the reason we set up shop 17 years ago. Huh. What about metadata? Does anybody have anything to say about metadata as far as boosting income? Eliezer? Uh, Eliezer, yeah. Well yeah no i i i think that's kind of like the foundation it's like a house you know you can build on it and you can keep adding additions and build your adu and have all this stuff but if you don't have a strong foundation everyone you're just gonna crumble down and uh here in california well you know you gotta make sure you got it right or earthquakes come but so when when you look at a song i think that the main foundation of the song is that is the metadata i think that uh, the communication with a lot of these independent labels right now that are distributed by a major or have someone like your church or, or, or the publishers and stuff like that, that they're dealing with their artists. I think that the communication between them and us as publishers in when they, you know, they, they know, okay, well, I did the record. I have to send the, the label copy with all the information to make that happen. I think that always keeping the loop, the publisher and uh, that's like if just a matter of the processes, right? Of, of how do we get the information? Now, once you put the information in, how to do the, the, the matching rate and having the ability to go and, and, and match registrations that are not like all, all over the world. And, and you know, the more, the more you increase your matching rate, the more uh, on like on registers records are, are you going to have uh, in your system and the more that it can get paid. So, and, and I think that the, understanding that that comes from the conversation from the split. So it's kind of like everything is, you know, it's like, so you cannot talk about one without talking about the other. But uh, the, the most important thing, uh, thing I, I think is the communication between the, the, all the, the, the labels and, and uh, with us and, and how much we interact with them and the, the, the writers putting us in touch with the artist team so that when these songs are being released, <clears throat> we we got that done and that's on yep. the on the artist releases perspective but when you think about sync a lot of these artists you know that uh, and writers that they have all these songs in their in their you know hard drive you know making sure that they go in and they register those songs and, and they submit it to their publishers so that then we can go and take those records and pitch them for sync for opportunities for apple fitness peloton and and, and looking at all these opportunities but we need to have it registered so we need to have the metadata correct we need to have everything so that then we can globally take it to our partners and, and, and make money out of it. Yeah, but if you think about it, you know, where we were 20 years ago, where songwriters were 20 years ago, where labels were 20 years ago, right? Where you didn't, there was no metadata. You know, there was, there was data, but now in order to get on a DSP, you really need to have your data organized, right? And because of that, we're collecting as an industry so much more money around the world than was happening, you know, years ago when, you had to rely on, you know, manual checks and balances. That's that's not the case now. Uh, Jorge, uh, I, I'd like to to add that uh, a, a practical advice because uh, uh, I know that the audience here uh, uh, at LAMC, uh, some of I suppose some of them are um, completely indie, and uh, I think that it's very important that they, when they register their songs, if they don't have a publisher like us, right? We, 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 it's part of what we do when, when you have a publisher, but if you don't have a publisher, it's very important that in your registrations, you include all the recording information of the songs uh, of the, it's very important that they include the, the master site information, uh, including the ISRC codes, uh, to be sure that the, uh, uh, titles are correctly uh, uh, placed and 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 uh, if there's any anything that um, uh, is reflected differently to actually correct it because um, it might be actually uh, causing troubles in their uh, collection uh, because you know so, some in, in some societies it might reflect uh, the change a little bit earlier but down the road uh, in some other countries, it might not. So it's very important to be on top of your of your uh, data and metadata on the on your uh, registrations and to include everything from the recording side and from the distribution side in your uh, publishing registrations. 
Talk to your PRO. They'll help you. Your PRO will help you. The PROs will help. Uh, that's a very good point. That's a very good point, Emilio. I mean, um, having your information up to date is key as far as boosting your revenues and your earnings. Um, okay, so moving forward to to a next point, I like to draw on Gustavo one more time. So song camps, they're they're another trend. It's a very prevalent trend. What are uh, your general thoughts about song camps for the people in this group, starting with Gustavo? They're much more fun than camping, for sure. <laughs> um, ah! I think uh, they we have too many. Uh, I think we've gone too far. Um, we got to be careful that as publishers as, and as A and Rs that uh, it's not just like a party or a social occasion to you know get people together in a room or or several studios at the same time. Uh, like Alex said, uh, now that we have to take care of our music and make sure that the quality of the music that we're putting out it, it keeps up, um, uh, you know, the high level that already is. Same thing with uh, with the song camps. I think our A and Rs need to do uh, a very extensive uh, uh, job in, in in picking the right people uh, and don't waste any anybody's time because that's that's the flip side. If, if you just if you just put song camps together with no end game, uh, there's not a recording, whatever. If you don't have an artist that you specifically writing for. And you just mix people. One day you put three people together, then you change them. You put some that just doesn't work anymore. Um, I think that, that that is that is the key. Uh, they're super useful. Um, a lot of cuts have come from song camps, but they need to be super targeted. So you don't waste again. So you don't waste you know the writer's time, and you don't waste time. Very good point, um, Alex. What what do you think about song camps? Uh, agree. With Gustavo, uh, we started doing, a lot of people started doing song camps, mostly when Latin music started to go global. And we had other territories asking for our producers and writers to do uh, sessions. So it started kind of like, oh, let's do a song camp because, you know, let's see what comes out. But absolutely now it has to be targeted. Absolutely, it has to be with a strategy in mind. I do believe they work. And I do believe there is an importance of putting people from different regions, different backgrounds, genres, uh, languages together, because that's what uh, is going to be coming out musically. But it has to be well thought and strategized. And, uh, I like them, but again, not to waste the time, but it has to be targeted and well um, prepared and developed. But I, I think they work. Very good. All right. Well, going, we're going to be running out of time pretty soon. So we're going to wind down the last few questions. Um, there's another big trend with uh, music catalog. And it has to do with acquisitions. Uh, any thoughts about that? And I'll draw on Larry for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I think, um, first of all, I've, we've never been busier. Um, we've, we must have, you know, 40 or so acquisitions in the pipeline. Um, it's an interesting time. We specialize in uh, older music, iconic music. Um, I rarely participate uh, in artist catalogs that are, let's say, less than 15 years old. Um, I don't believe young artists should be selling their rights. Um, I think they should be holding them. I think they should be nurturing them. And I think they should be maintaining control. Um, I, I almost chuckle when I see my competitors buying very young catalogs, I'm not sure how they can affect growth. Um, I think there is going to be more and more uh, capital coming into the market because there are so many um, positive attributes to owning music catalogs. You know, they're, they're long life. Um, they, they deliver fantastic returns with a, a little elbow grease in marketing. You know, you can take a, six or seven percent cash on cash return and turn it into a 15 percent 
cash on cash return. And it's very hard to get those types of, you know, rates and safe, um, you know, safe assets. Uh, um, and again, you know, the reason why I invest in Prince and Ray Charles and Burt Backrack and the Doors and Whitney Houston is because they're very, very predictable income streams. And with a little marketing um, and branding ingenuity, you can create new revenue streams. Um, you know, that's, that's my focus. And I think that's, uh, that trend is going to continue for quite some time. The trend of, of buying, you know, music catalogs. Yeah, I agree with that. All right. Um, so basically what we've identified in this panel is that as far as trends go, Latin music is very hot right now, but don't be complacent. Listen to Alexandra. Things could change <laughs> any minute now. Other trends are song camps. Make sure you use the time wisely. Catalog acquisitions. Make sure you, you buy the right... The, don't sell if if you're a young writer, I think would be the advice from at least one panelist. <laughs> Pain points, it would be splits. If to all the writers who are listening to us, if you can find a way to, to agree on splits before the songs come out, that would be great because we'd be able to collect more money for everyone. Um, and another pain point is just making sure that all of the information is correctly stored at the different databases because it's not just one publisher database it's all the pros it's all the dsps it's everyone needs to have that information and that having the correct information everywhere will boost your income and overall though i think the message from this panel is that we are here for you the songwriter this is why we do what we do so with that in mind does anybody have any pardon wor parting words of advice for any of the songwriters in the audience who may be listening? Anything that you want to tell any of the songwriters who may be listening? Don't stop writing. Continue to evolve your songwriting <laughs> techniques. Write with as many people as you can and learn from them and continue to build what it is that is gonna be your word and your, your mark in whatever it is that you're creating. But don't stop, don't stop yeah. writing. And remember, the music industry starts with a song. So writers are that are creating songs are a crucial, most important part of the music industry in general. And um, I would say also, <clears throat> you have to hustle. Uh, at the end of the day, if this is a career, uh, you need to, uh, to your point, Ellie, uh, a songwriter needs to write basically every day. You need to work every day. If you don't work any day, uh, every day, uh, you know the results are going to be what they're going to be. Uh, yeah, it's a hobby. This is a this is a profession. Uh, don't stop writing. Uh, yes, uh, inspiration is great, but at the end of the day, sometimes you need to sit down and keep on working on songs or get together with other people. But it's like an everyday job, and that's. Let's say that that would increase uh, the chances of uh, having a successful career. Education. And there is no, there is no Spotify, there is no Apple without a songwriter or without yeah. a song. And yeah. so, you know, we're we're all here to protect the songwriter and to protect legacies. I, yes. I'd say I say that um, it's following what Gustavo said. Uh, it's it's very important consist to be consistent in your writing. Um, um, Many people have come to my office saying, "Hey, Emilio, I am your new your new bad bunny." They, they, what they don't know is that that guy uh, not only worked his ass off to work to to be where he is right now, but the guy still works like the first freaking day. He works harder now than he, than he used to work when he was a no one, um, and he records like crazy songs like crazy and that work ethic that I, I think it's something that everyone has to have in life right uh you you uh, whatever you do in life either uh, you're a, a writer or whatever um or a publisher we 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 need to to you know um keep up and 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 that's actually something that defies me also as his publisher 
because I, I have a guy that not only is my best client, but he works really, really hard every single day. And it makes one, you know, want to be better, you know, so uh, that's, that's my best advice. Thank you. Thank you, Emilio. With that, uh, we have come to the end of our panel. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. I think this was very informative. I learned quite a bit, and I was very happy to be here. Thank you so very much for listening. I don't know if somebody comes from LAMC or whatever.